Hello. Um, I wonder if uh, everybody is here already, but let's, um, I think let's kick it off. Um, welcome to another one of Zap's um, product, product design talks. Um, today, the focus is on UX and UX research. Uh, we've got a good amount of RSVPs. I'm hoping everybody that RSVP is actually here. Um, looks like there's a lot of interest in this topic. Um, so today we'll be discussing UX research in healthcare, the story of a missing mouse in a paper house. We just chatted about that with Chris, who's our speaker for today. He will circle back to that title at some point, I'm hoping. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to Chris for taking the time to put a talk together for us and for doing this um, for the community. I always say everybody that does this, we do it for free and everybody volunteers their own time. So Chris, thank you so much. Justin as well. Um, you know, everybody puts in a little bit of their own personal time to make this all work. Um, I just need to do a quick uh, thank you to all our sponsors. Um, we've got Code Capsules. Code Capsules um, is a platform as a service. Uh, we've got Code Space, who when we have events um, that has a that that needs a location like a workshop, um, Code Space Academy um, has given up their uh, boardroom area for us to do talks in. They are predominantly a coding and technology education um, uh, company. Um, I think it's like what we know as a boot camp. Um, then there's NML. Justin is from NML. Uh, they are financial services, uh, a financial services and software development company. Um, thanks, Justin, for your time. And then uh, the company that I work for is called IO, and we are digital product builders. Um, thank you to all our sponsors. Then uh, lastly, before we close off and hand over to Chris, um, just quickly want to say about, I, I'm going to give time, or Chris is going to take some time to delve deeper into his history. It's definitely interesting uh, from what I've seen. Um, but Chris is a co-owner of a UX uh, research company called How Might We? And you can find them at howmightwe.co.za if you want to look um, a little bit deeper into what they do. And then I hope you don't mind, Chris, but I've, I've dropped your LinkedIn handle here at the bottom if people want to connect with you. And then... Um, in terms of uh, Q&A and questions, uh, there's a comment section. So throughout the talk, if you have questions, um, please just drop them into the chat. And um, our plan is to attend to all the questions at the end of the talk. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Justin. And Chris, I'll hand over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Liesl. I really appreciate it. Hi, this is uh, the first time I'm doing a talk like this um, digitally, so we'll see how it goes. This is a learning curve for me. Um, yes, as, as I was introduced, I think um, it would be nice if I introduce myself. I, it feels like I'm talking into a blank room, but hopefully there's lots of people watching. Um, who knows? Uh, if you do have comments, as Dilza said, please post them in the, the YouTube chat, the comment section, and we'll we'll see them. Cool. So a little bit of a background for me. I basically never really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. I still don't think I do. Uh, so I tried a number of different things. Um, I was a professional magician for a number of years. I started studying at the College of Magic when I was six, when I was 11, sorry, um, for six years. And then I did events management, um, which moved into sound engineering. I studied as a sound engineer. I then um, studied photography. Um, after realizing that that's not what I wanted to do, I decided to change careers completely and um, go to India and find myself. Uh, I then started studying industrial design at CPUT and then found my love for design there. Um, I was able to win a scholarship um, to one semester of Masters of Interaction Design in Malmo in Sweden, which kind of solidified my my love for design. Something that I realized only a little bit later on in my design career was that everything that I have done up until that point has been creating experiences and delightful moments for other people. Um, if it's on stage doing a magic trick or putting on fire dancing show, um, it's understanding how 
what I do um, acts at somebody else's um, experience at a distance? And how do you create that uh, with what you have? And even in service design, we say there's front of house and back of house and, and understanding what how those need to work together to create experiences. So that's what I've been doing. Um, I started my UX design career uh, about 15 years ago or so at a company called Flow Interactive, um, which was an end-to-end -end UX design company. Um, and we were a startup. We worked with a lot of financial companies. Um, and then eventually we were bought by Deloitte and we did the corporate thing for a while. So our clients shifted from um, slightly smaller companies to mines and large corporate companies, uh, which was fun. And I learned an awful lot about how corporate culture works and how money works on a scale that I could never could conceive before. But after a while of that, I realized that I felt like I was missing out on a few areas, especially the smaller companies that couldn't afford Deloitte, um, healthcare, which was an area that Deloitte just didn't really play in. So a couple of us, um, Mandy, Jackie, and myself left Deloitte and started How Might We about five years ago. So we started um, How Might We as a UX design company. So we did end-to-end -end design, um, UX strategy, writing, uh, the whole UX experience. Um, and after a couple of years, we realized that the thing that we were really good at and the thing that we did a lot of was the connection with customers. So one of our requirements for all of our projects was that there has to be some form of customer involvement. I, I fundamentally believe that if you're not talking to customers, you're not doing UX research, but maybe that's a, a debate for another day. Um, so we... We took that thing that we were doing, which is the connection with the customer, the research, the usability test, some form of, of customer connection, and started doing that more and more for companies that were hiring UX designers. Um, UX designers are super amazing doing work inside companies, but often they didn't have enough time to get to usability testing or get to customer research. So that's where we came in. We would, we would help these existing design teams uh, with that customer involvement. And over the last 15 years or so, I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing companies. Um, most of them are in South Africa. There are a number of international guys there and you can see they range from e-commerce to service, um, a lot of finance companies. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of us know, if we work in UX design, the financial industry has a much higher maturity when it comes to design and UX and customer experience. Um, but the area that, that how might we wanted to focus on was in healthcare. Um, we just felt that that was an area that we all were drawn to, that there was really difficult problems to solve. And I think um, not, not the highest level of maturity as an industry when it comes to customer experience, um, but an area where we could do some really cool stuff. Um, and so if I were to just highlight the healthcare companies in that pile of logos, um, I'm not gonna be able to speak to all of them. Unfortunately, I just don't have enough time, but um, I think it might be quite fun to just look at a few. Um, I'm gonna give you a little description of a few of them. Some of them should be hopefully recognizable and um, some of them might not be. So Health Force is one I'm gonna to touch on quite a lot today. They, there are definitely how might we Longest running client um, uh, and biggest client, I suppose, when it comes to number of research projects we run with them. And they've got a few things. So HealthForce is effectively a piece of technology. It's a practice management system that runs in pharmacies that are in uh, clinics that are in pharmacies. So I don't know if you've ever been to a pharmacy, Discan, Clicks, Medicare, and you look at the sort of the back of the pharmacy, there's usually a door which has like clinic and there's a nurse that sits there. And most of the time, we don't really go there because it's not that accessible and it feels a little bit weird, but it's a lovely environment. The nurses are amazing. They tend to do a lot of vitality health checks. They weigh babies a lot. They do baby vaccines, but they are highly skilled nurses. And some of the times they are not able to uh, write a script or give advice on a particular um, diagnosis. So what Health Force does is it enables those nurses through the use of a big screen and a webcam to access doctors. So Health Force has a, a group of a network of doctors that work online and the nurse 
while they are um, consulting a patient in one of those clinics. On the screen, I'll show you a picture now. On the screen, they, are, they can video call a doctor and they have access to that doctor, doctor's advice. If the doctor needs to write a script, they can send the script to the, the nurse. And it basically enables the nurse to do a lot more than just the vitality health checks and weighing babies and, and giving some advice. It's a, it's a collaborative effort there. Kenna is a, an app direct for patients. So it's an app that everybody can download and it allows you to video call those doctors that I was talking about earlier. Different group of doctors, but basically the same, where you as a customer can download the app for 185 Rand, you can video call a nurse, a doctor, or a mental health professional. Um, and I'll get into more of that just now. Discam, you should know, hopefully, uh, they're a pharmacy, they do medication, and they're also trying to expand into more than just medication. They want to be the, the place where good health starts. Um, it's a lot more primary care. And that's why all of the Discams have um, clinics with nurses in them as well. Vula is an app um, which allows doctors and other clinicians to refer and communicate with each other securely. So think of like a super secure WhatsApp between healthcare professionals. Sometimes you'll find that you'll go to a, a, a doctor and they'll refer you to a GP and that doctor communicates with that, or you go to a, GP, a specialist, that doctor will communicate with the specialist over WhatsApp. And there's a lot of sensitive information there which shouldn't really be on a platform not, not made for that. So Vula, allows doctors to share photos and recommendations securely. It started as something a little different, and maybe if we have time, Annie can, can explain how that worked. MediClinic, hopefully you also recognize, it's a hospital chain, private hospital chain. They have um, doctor's offices as well. Uh, we've done a couple of different research projects with them to look at how nurses interact with the space and with uh, patients and how to make that experience more delightful. Cipla is a um, generic pharmaceutical company and um, they make drugs, but they also sponsor a number of container clinics. Uh, Shop Left is one that we worked with where they had nurses in container clinics in rural areas where a, they had iPads, access to iPads, which would save patient information and records and things like that. I'm not going to be able to tell stories of all of them, but I thought it would be quite fun to tell one or two stories. So next up is story time. And this hopefully would explain the, the title. It's not as exciting as it sounds, but we'll get into it. The first one I want to talk about is Health Force. So as I was saying earlier, Health Force enables a nurse to video call a doctor. So this is a photo of a clinic that's in a what was a Medicare at the time, which is now a discamp. And uh, this is the little room that you got. You can see there's all sorts of stuff on the walls. Um, you can see our, our nurse on the bottom right-hand corner, and she's potentially sitting with a patient. Um, if a patient shows something that the nurse doesn't really know about, or she just needs a second opinion, or she just wants some advice, she can ask for the doctor. So she's able to um, video call the doctor and the doctor will appear on the screen. There's a camera you can see above the screen and they have a conversation. What's great about how HealthForce works is that everything that the nurse has inputted into her system, the doctor has access to. So the doctor doesn't have to repeat anything that the, the nurse and the patient have, have spoken about. The doctor can just jump right in and say, right, I see your vitals. I can see that you've done this test. I can see that this test came back negative and then have a conversation with the patient and with the doctor. If the doctor recommends any additional tests, the nurse can facilitate those tests. Um, the doctor can then write a sick note, can write a prescription, can write additional advice, uh, even a, a referral to somewhere else. But it basically enables this doctor to be available throughout the country where uh, access to a doctor might not be that possible. In the beginning, so um, this is HealthForce as it is now. HealthForce existed as, a, as an app in a clinic, um, and it looked like this. We were asked as the UX design company, how might we, to see why nurses weren't using it. Um, and as if there's any designers on the call, we, we would automatically go, well, yeah, I know why nurses aren't using this. Uh, there's no hierarchy, there's no information architecture, there's no affordance on things, I don't know what I'm looking at. 
there's a number of things that we can do to make this interface easier to use. But instead, what we did is we said, well, let's figure out in what context this thing is being used and, and why aren't they calling doctors? So, so this was an interface that enabled the doctor to do, the, the nurse to do all of the things that I've just spoken about, add patient information and details and, and capture a whole lot of information um, about the patient notes and such. And it wasn't being used. Um, and we needed to figure out why. The, the leadership of the pharmacy persuaded the nurses to use this piece of information because they needed it for data security. So told the nurses to use it and yet they weren't really seeing the adoption that they wanted to. to. So what we did is we spent a good couple of days, almost weeks with nurses in clinics. I think we went to about six or seven clinics across the country. And we sat with the nurses and understood how do they do this? How do they interact with it? Not with patients in the room, I'll get into patients in a moment, but on their own, how did they interact with this piece of software? In what contexts were they using this thing? And we saw a lot of super interesting stuff. So the first thing we noticed was that when a patient comes in that hasn't been there for a while, the nurse needs to go and check that patient's records. So they would go to another room and check the filing cabinet and find the old record to figure out what was told to that patient and what they recommended last time. So that was a little strange because I figure we could probably make that life, their life a little bit easier. But on the paperwork train, we looked at their clinic and we started to see super interesting symptoms of this paperwork thing. So they had paper everywhere. They had paper on the wall reminding them about the different vaccines that were available. There was many different places for patient history. We saw um, consent. So the way that a patient gave consent was on a physical piece of paper. They signed it, that gets put in a pile and then gets put in the filing cabinet at the end of the day. But the, the one thing that was the most important was the diary. So on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the patient history. That's where the, the nurses wrote everything. Um, on the day, they would see a patient and they would write their notes what, for what they recommended to the patient, what the patient came in for in this diary. <clears throat> and to, to, to them, this was the most important artifact in their clinic. So when we expected them to use this piece of inf this piece of technology we were now competing with these pieces of paper with the diary with the appointments and it wasn't nearly as delightful for a nurse because she writes down something on a piece of paper she puts it over there and she knows that when she comes back tomorrow it's going to be there she trusts her own handwriting she knows what's happening um she puts something on the board she knows it's going to be there when the nurses were asked very strongly to use this piece of software, what the nurses were doing is doing all of their paperwork during the consultation. And then after the consultation or in the evening would capture on the, on the computer. So we saw this disconnect between how we wanted this piece of software to work and how they were interacting with it. It wasn't just about the, the services that this thing could offer, it was how they understood it fitted into the system. Not only did they feel think that uh, writing on a piece of paper was quicker and easier, and they trusted that it would stay there when they put it down there, a lot of the nurses didn't actually believe that a piece of technology, which video called a doctor, was legal. They, they believed that there was a lot of questions about what would be considered um, malpractice if the doctor recommended something and the nurse said, great, we'll do that. And the patient has a reaction to it. Whose fault is it? Is it the nurses or the doctors? So there was a lot of work that we had to do to explain how this worked, where it fitted into the legal system. And a lot of this was before COVID when actually the laws were stricter and, and COVID did help telemedicine in making it more accessible to people and we understanding exactly the nuances of what is acceptable and what isn't. So when we come back to this interface, the actual interface itself had very little to do with why nurses weren't calling doctors. It was very prescriptive, 
but actually it had more to do with how the nurses were managing their clinic than, than anything else. So when we went into the design phase, we took all of that information. We said, well, okay, let's just pretend we're not going to try and redesign this. Let's see what, how do we highlight the values of this tool and how do we make it accessible so that they can do what they currently do and not change their behavior too much. So what we did is um, we ran a design sprint and um, all of our wireframes that we did out of that focused heavily on the notes. So we said, here is a big block where you write whatever you want to write. You're not prescribed by all of these little tick boxes and in the process, you do whatever you want to do. You, you, you're the professional, you know how to look after patients. You decide what that patient's um, process is. So you put in the notes and we try to augment it a little bit with a little bit of value. So one of the things that we we believed was a value for nurses to be able to use a system like this was history. So you'll see this is what um, the first design looks like. Put a lot of emphasis on here are your notes. This is where you can type anything you want. Um, but also on the left, you'll see patient's history. So one of the points of pain that we highlighted from our research was the nurse having to look for a particular patient's past experiences or past consultations, how they did it is they had their diary with their notes in it and they would say to the patient, when were you last here, dear? Okay, let me have a look. And they would page through their diary and check what they had written the last time. If it was longer than a year ago, they would have to go to the filing cabinet and have a look. So we really wanted to show that this piece of software would help them see their history. That was kind of the biggest thing that we wanted to show, as well as you do whatever you want to do in this consultation, it's yours and your notes here. On top of that, we weren't saying to them, you have to do specific tests, you have to do this protocol. You decide if you want to add anything above your notes or in addition to your notes. So you'll see there add to consultation. We've got vitals measures, ICD-10, which did become mandatory after a while. Um, vaccines, attendance certificates, there's a couple of things that they can add to the consultation based on whatever they decide is relevant for that particular patient. And not only did this happen on the interface, but, but we had to roll this out with a lot more additional supports and behavior change stuff. So this came with a number of um, group sessions with nurses, uh, training, for the nurses to watch videos. And I, I suppose the most exciting actually was a, was a staging environment for the nurses to play. And one of the things that we found with the previous interface was the nurses were a little bit nervous. First of all, they were scared of technology because fan damn gold piece of technology. They're not exactly the youngest group of people. Um, a lot of them had come from previous work in ER or they'd worked at a hospital. And now they're wanting to work in a clinic. They're, you know, over 50. They wanted to like slow down a little bit. They don't want to have to deal with stuff that's too new and too scary. Um, so for them to interact with technology was, was difficult. And them breaking something was a big fear. So them doing something wrong or them calling a doctor by mistake or them not really knowing how to interact with the screen, not only was scary for them, but also they didn't want to look like they didn't know what they were doing in front of the patient because that's not very nice. So we needed to have a space for the nurses to feel confident in how the system works. So we created a staging environment where they could add in anything they wanted to add. They could create fake patients and they could play with everything. We basically said, you can do anything you want to do. You're not going to break it, go crazy. And that worked really well. The nurses were very receptive to being able to see how it worked. And then over a while, they were able to see the value. Um, and the big value came in, not only for seeing the history, but also if a nurse was sick one day, um, they could, the patient could go and see a, a colleague and all of the previous nurses' notes were there. They wouldn't have to the patient wouldn't have to re-explain themselves over and over again. Um, in the testing environment, what we also allowed the nurses to do was to call a doctor whenever they wanted to. So a group of health force customer success team was available and they would answer the call like they were a doctor and they could have a, a demo experience. So a doctor, a nurse could put a call through, experience what it would be like for a patient, add some photos, get a script, and none of that information was saved. They can just kind of 
play with it and see what it's like, which, um, which worked really well. One of the things there you can see um, add photos. And I think this is a nice, another little story of, of something that surprised us. One of the important communication mechanisms between the nurse and the doctor is not only all the notes and the vitals and the tests and whatever else they might be doing in the clinic, but photos. If there's particularly strange rash or there's a wound that the nurse needs to get advice of, they can take a photo and send it to the doctor. And we needed to design a mechanism where a photo could get to the doctor, which wasn't a webcam because the webcam is quite far away and wouldn't get the detail that we needed it to. So we created an MVP which said, well, let's see if we can use the nurse's phone because uh, that's a camera and they, they have it with them. Um, let's see. So the interface, once you click on the camera, <clears throat> how it worked was if you clicked on using a smartphone, it would uh, give you a little barcode, you scanned the barcode, um, it opened a web app, which was a camera, you could take a picture, and because of that particular <coughs> um, link, it would upload the photo to that profile only. So then no photo was saved on the phone, it was only saved on that patient's profile. And that worked really well to the point where it actually is still the way that um, most nurses take their pictures how they get their cameras and how the camera connects to Wi-Fi and what happens if a camera gets stolen, that's still an ongoing process. Um, but that seemed to work quite well in, in a way to get um, pictures to the, to the doctors. And um, one of the, the pieces of feedback that we got from that was taking a picture on a piece of skin is great and in an eyeball is great, but sometimes you need to take a picture of something like in your ear or in, up your nose. And this is where an otoscope comes in. So an otoscope is a, is a stick with a camera, little camera on it, and you can stick the stick in two different places and get interesting uh, pictures. So we thought, well, let's give some of the nurses otoscopes and see if they will use it. Um, they have asked us for it, so it probably is needed. Let's do it. Otoscopes are not cheap, so we didn't get them for everybody. We just ha had a go at, at, um, at sending them out to a few. And very quickly, we saw that the nurses weren't using them. Um, and we thought this was strange because we'd done the research. The nurses said they wanted otoscopes. We gave them otoscopes. We created a feature which allowed nurses to take photos with otoscopes, and, and yet we weren't seeing the interaction. So as UX researchers, what do we do? Well, we go and usability test it with nurses. So we went in and asked nurses to take pictures, again, with our patients, see how they can use it. And what we found in retrospect seems so obvious, but it was just, it's a nice moment where you go, oh, this is why I do usability testing, is we had designed it in such a way that you could take a picture and you push the space bar and it takes a picture and you push the space bar again and it takes another picture. And what the nurses were doing is they were holding the otoscope with one hand and then they were taking the other hand to open the earlobe to stick the otoscope in. But now they have no other hand to take a picture. They were like taking pictures with their elbows and it was just awkward and weird. And it, it seems so obvious now, but we just missed it completely. Um, so we had to iter uh, iterate on the design. And what we did rather is we put a timer on that picture. So you click go and every 10 seconds, it takes a picture. So the, the nurse can really get in there and see how the pictures are being taken, take three or four pictures, and then delete the ones that they, they didn't need. It made that experience a lot easier. And then we saw a little bit more of an uptake in the otoscopes. So that you can see the countdown timer. And then you saw the, the bottom row there would, would populate with, with pictures that you can then add to the consultation. And then if they call the doctor, the doctor would see all of those. I've spoken a lot about nurses, but if we stay in the pharmacy for a moment, I would like to, to move us to the other part of the pharmacy, which is probably the one that we know the most, and that is the dispensary. Uh, and this is super interesting because this, I don't know if any of you have ever looked over the screen at a pharmacist when they are interacting with the screen, the majority of pharmacists in South Africa use a screen that looks like this. This is Unisolve. It was um, designed and created in 1984. It has not really been updated. I mean, a lot of features have been built. It's quite a powerful system built on COBOL, but 
the interface has not been changed in a good number of years. Both um, Discam and Clicks use this. Um, it's a powerhouse of functionality, but as you can see, it's not very delightful. What's super interesting about pharmacists is they are a sect of users like I've never met before. They are the most power user users I've ever met. Because most of the pharmacists have grown up their entire working career on one system, they can almost interact with this blindfolded. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced this when you've gotten medication. A pharmacist just looks at you, hands on the keyboard, tap, 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 and then they hit enter like 700 million times. Tap, 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 and then hit enter. And they know how many times they need to do it. It's like, oh, this is 184 times, not 183, because that's a different system. Anyway, the point of what I'm trying to say is the pharmacists are phenomenal users of this system. And if anyone were to ever redesign the system, they have to take into account an awful lot of muscle memory, previous experience, mental models. This thing is being taught in universities to pharmacists. So the way that this, the, the data is structured, the way that you understand how medication works is impacted by this piece of software. So it's an awful lot of work to come in and go, well, you know what, we're going to redesign it. And the biggest issue is these, these pharmacists are so fast because they are, uh, they're incentivized by getting the queue down and helping people as quickly as possible and accuracy that the way that they interact with this piece of software is they have two hands on the keyboard and they type really quickly. So here is me, designer, and like, oh, you know what we could do? We could have lovely things, which requires a mouse. That would probably make the most amount of people annoyed very, very quickly. And this maybe will help with the title of the talk, which is in a pharmacy, you've got the nurses whose piece of software is competing with paper. Well, for a pharmacist, you're interacting with a system with which cannot have a mouse. It cannot have a trackpad. It, the, the time it takes for you to move a mouse and click on something is too long. Uh, even considering like a touch screen, getting the, the hands to move from a keyboard position up and down would take too long. They're, they're standing there for hours, they're resting their hands on the keyboard and they're just typing as fast as possible. So when eventually somebody um, redesigns this, they have to take that into account massively. I have spoken um, a lot about pharmacists and nurses, but I suppose they are the main users of these, these systems. And a doctor would be a user and a specialist would be a user. They're the ones interacting with the, the system. But in the healthcare environment, who is the user? We don't have a user, we have many users with many different needs. And funnily enough, the person I haven't spoken to much is the patient, because often the patient is not the user. The patient is one of the most important stakeholders in the system, but they're not the ones interacting with the piece of software. So one of the things that we need to consider in the system is what are the other players? Um, the nurse, the doctor, pharmacist, and then the most importantly, the patient. And interestingly enough, so, so something that I bumped into um, when I was doing this um, research in healthcare is I come from a design background, design thinking background, customer centered background. We came from HCI, which tend to, uh, so human computer interaction, which um, turned into um, user centered design, which then became human centered design. It, it, it evolved and the idea of the center design changed. So I'm like, okay, well, you know what we're doing? We're doing patient center design, great. Everybody understands what that means. And for a year, I said patient center design and the clinicians that I was working for said patient center design. And yet after a year, I realized that we were meaning two different things, that patient centricity in healthcare is a thing. It exists, it has a process to it, 
It's an understood concept. It is not, it's a lot of overlap, but it is not human-centered design, the, the, the design thinking process that, that we understand it to be, which is super interesting. So there was like, a, oh yeah, okay, I shouldn't just call it patient-centered or nurse-centered or doctor-centric willy-nilly. I need to understand that that actually has meaning. Um, and just to touch on that, I suppose, why do we why do we need patient centricity? And it's because it's probably the biggest problem in healthcare at the moment, which is as a patient, um, a patient interacts with this very fragmented system. So a patient goes to a GP and comes back and the GP says, you know what, you should really go to the specialist. So then that patient goes, okay. Then they go to the specialist. Now, maybe the GP has sent some notes to the specialist, maybe not. It's up to the patient to explain again what's happening. They're not going to get it right. They're going to miss some things. They're going to go fine. Then the specialist says, you know what? Actually, you're going to need to get an MRI. You're going to need some blood work or you're going to have to go to the hospital. Maybe that specialist communicates with the hospital. If they do, who knows what the fidelity of those notes are. The pa it's up to the patient to then take that experience with them. They don't know the terminology. They don't really understand what's happening. And yet they are the ones that have to own this experience, which is not great. It's a very fragmented system. Because of this, it's often very costly. So as a patient, we tend to find ourselves, if we have to go to multiple visits, we're paying each time. I can speak for a day on fee-for-service versus value-based healthcare, but that's another whole talk. What's happening here is that the the, the clinicians are being incentivized to see a patient for a consultation done. They are not being incentivized to solve the problem of the patient. So once you leave that doctor's room, I mean, they might think about it, but to be honest, they're not thinking about the patient anymore. They're seeing the next patient because that's the thing that makes them the money that can buy them sandwiches. So it's a very fragmented, it's a high cost environment. And a thing, the sort of the holy grail of a good healthcare system is a um, electronic health record, a single view of a patient, which is where when we say patient-centric, a lot of people understand this to be. It's a single record of a patient, which you can carry to different experiences. So when a nurse writes some notes, it's yours and you take it with you so that when you go to the next clinician, they have access to those notes and they can see what the other people have been doing. Unfortunately, in this country, we don't have that. Um, there are a couple of countries who are doing this quite well. There are a number of companies that are trying to do this. So Discovery has one electronic health record, which kind of follows you around unless you are out, unless you go to a clinician outside of that network and then they don't have access to it. Unfortunately, you as the patient who, according to Papia, own that information, you can't access it if you go to discovery and say, can I see my data? They have no mechanism to, to show you, which I think is weird. And because there is very little communication between clinicians, there is little standardization. Yeah, we have, we have um, protocols in place for particular episodes. So an episode is like a, a disease, let's say diabetes. There are things that we do that, we, that, that the clinicians will do in that episode and that's understood and it's, it's agreed upon, but the nuances of how that plan rolls out isn't totally defined. Uh, you've got a GP, you get told one thing, you've got another GP and you get told another thing. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced that. Also in, in mental health, that's a big one too. So this is patient centricity. The idea is that we're trying to create a unified experience for a particular patient. And you have a team of doctors that work around you as opposed to these individual. Because that's really, really important in healthcare, obviously we need to talk to patients and um, they are the most important stakeholder. They might not be the user for a lot of our interfaces, but they are the, the core of any sort of healthcare. Talking to patients can be a little bit daunting um, for a number of reasons. So first of all, Healthcare and a person's health is a very sensitive subject. Um, we don't want to, we are not clinicians. We don't want to expect a respondent or a, a person coming to our research to talk about the results of a test, or to talk about what happened um, 
in um, in a particular experience with a bl blood example, a blood test. The thing is, we're going to have to talk to patients, but we have to do it very delicately. So the way that we do it is we talk about their experiences with healthcare services and not the results. Um, so we'll say, last time you visited this clinician, how did that go? Tell me about that experience. And if if they want to talk about their results, that that's okay. We have consent and we understand how to anonymize the data. That's that's fine. But we do need to explain that we don't care about the results themselves. We care about their experiences with each of the the healthcare systems, other healthcare um, clinicians and um, spaces that they go to. Um. A thing that we do talk a lot about is finance in that space. So in South Africa, paying for healthcare is a big thing. Um, so we have to talk about how the money works. And that, and that, I suppose, comes from the way that we do research in the financial industry, which is also delicate, but it's a little bit easier to talk about. Um, and then lastly, we talk about um, family structures and dependencies. So we'll try and understand in a family structure, do you look after anybody? How do you... What do you do with your, when your kid is sick? Uh, do you go to the pharmacist first, a nurse? And uh, what do you do when they get really sick? Um, how, do you do the same for yourself? And Or you, do you have parents that you need to look after? Um, do you pay for granny to go to the hospital? Do you drive them to the hospital? How does that work? And that we can often get quite a lot of the story while still being very um, sensitive and, and uh, polite about somebody's particular healthcare experience. What is really interesting, is when you bump into research in healthcare. Because research in healthcare is its own thing as well. And we've had a number of situations where we tend not to call what we do research because when you go to a hospital and you say we're doing research, that's medical research. And that requires a very different set of skills. It's a different type of project. Um, it requires IRB approval, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, so what we do is we say, well, it's it's interviews with patients, it's interviews, or it's a survey, or it's a it's a group discussion, um, and we be very careful about when we call it research and when we don't. And lastly, I just mentioned earlier, um, sometimes we need to consider IRB, which is a very terrifying thing in some cases, and we try our best to not talk about it, but it's actually really important. And IRB is um, Institutional Review Board. So like in the States, um, IRB might be the FDA. Um, they the, they're the review board that'll give um, rules for particular drugs. And in South Africa, we need to get IRB approval for medical research, um, ethical approval, I suppose. If you've, if you've studied and done any sort of qual study at university, you would have asked for ethical approval, and that's an IRB. Um, and some some situations we have to consider that because it's it is a um, human studies, human factors study research. We are interacting with humans, and we need to really consider how that impacts that person. In South Africa, um, the National Health a research ethics council is a department of the department of health and they oversee a number of different um health research ethics councils uh where you can apply for um irb you know, ethical approval and um, most universities have them um but there are private ones which we can get to as well and you pay 20 or thirty thousand rand for ethical approval what we found as ux researchers is the line that we have to find, because if you go to one of these ethical board approvals, you say, well, when do I need ethical approval? They're going to go all the time. As soon as you interact with a human, you're going to need ethical approval, um, which I understand, but it's also a little bit difficult because does all market research need IRB? Uh, at what point does it become necessary? Yeah, we're following all the other uh, legislation, like POPIA, fine, consent, you know, we're we believe that we're ethical, but do we need outside approval? And where we found the line, not saying that I'm right yet, I'm, we have needed to do IRB approval in some places, where we found the line is if we impact a person's healthcare, so if our intervention, if our research skews somebody's 
plan or somebody's health getting better process, then yeah, absolutely, we're going to need somebody to check our homework. If any of our data is going to be published in a white paper or publicly accessible journal, again, we're going to need somebody to have a look at what we're doing. And lastly, if we're taking any sort of blood samples or we're interacting with biomatter, that's another place where we'll have to get um, get consent. But most of the time, what we're doing is we're observing what people, so it's a historical observation of how people interact with an experience. So we, we don't get involved in their experiences. We do not adjust their experiences. And that way, I think we can find our process, which doesn't require us to get ethical approval. We're probably going to have to in some situations because some of our clients want to publish some of the information that we're gathering. So then we'll have to go through that process. Sorry, I got really technical there for a moment. It was meant to be story time. I want to jump into another thing. So I thought it would be quite fun to talk about our process um, because I don't know if a lot of people talk about exactly how they do research. And so I thought it might be fun just to talk about how we do it. Hopefully it's interesting. We do a lot of um, in-depth interviews, a lot of usability testing, a lot of face-to-face -face stuff. We are a firm believer of one-on-one. -on -one, um, we have been involved in focus groups. We just find that one-on-one -on -one seems to be a little bit more uh, valuable for our research. So over the last couple of years, we do about 340 interviews a year. Um, that number is climbing, which is lovely. Most of our research at the moment is remote. Um, we were 100% in person before lockdown. We were then 100% remote during lockdown and we really like remote. Um, it's worked out to be super, use, super easy for participants. Um, we find that we are able to have a discussion like you're talking to a mate really quickly, um, especially if they're in their pajamas on the couch, which happens actually quite a lot. Um, we still do in person. So if we think that the technology is going to get in the way, then we will find a location and meet people at the location. But we found that um, being able to access the whole country and outside of the country very easily and quite cheaply um, makes for the number of sessions much, much easier. So we're able to get a little bit more information that way. A little structure of how we run it. So we have um, we've tried to package our research to make it really easy for our clients. Um, and the packages that we've created are kind of nice, unique, nice um, units, which um, people can, people can, uh, clients can buy once off, but ideally it's something that's, that's ongoing. So we have this thing called a subscription, which is basically a package a month or a package every second month. And the idea is, based on what you're needing, we have different sizes and we have different outcomes. So um, a normal one, let's say it's a usability test with five users, because that's a good sample size. Uh, we'll start off with a kickoff. And that's uh, just really understanding the brief, understanding what they need, explaining what you get out of a usability test, what you don't, what it's good for, what it's not good for. And then we need to recruit. So with a, a client that's given us a good understanding of who their customers are, we'll then create a recruit brief, which then goes out to our recruiters. We've got a number of recruiters across the country in Southern Africa, um, where we're able to get a lot of people, almost anyone, which is amazing. Um, and then during that process, we'll check with our clients to, to see, does this person fit, does it not fit? Um, so that we make sure we are talking to the right people. Also during that time, we'll make sure that we get the discussion guide ready, the protocol document, the testing plan, whatever you want to call it, list of questions we're going to be speaking to the, the customer with. Um, and then if there is a prototype, we will um, test that prototype with them. So we've got quite a comprehensive process with our um, participants. We actually have a number of calls with them through this time. So first of all, we, we recruit them. The recruiter screens them with the screener. And then we will do a test call, more than one test call potentially, where we see if they've got internet access, we check what device they've got, we check the camera works, um, just to make sure that when we do the sessions that is live streamed, that uh, it's all set up and ready to go. Then on the day, we run um, five one hour long interviews on a day. Um, we found it to be the best uh, for our clients because they can then take the day off and stream, they can watch the live stream with all of the sessions. So um, we stream that to a secure uh, Vimeo channel. 
which the clients will watch. We give them a mirror board. They take a whole lot of notes. And then we check in with them after each session. Did we cover everything we needed to? Why were there bugs in the prototype? That kind of stuff. And then we have two ways to process, um, to uh, synthesize, analyze and synthesize the data. So if it's a quick usability test where a product team want to get results really quickly and iterate and move forward, we recommend a workshop, which is an entire day where we go through the mirror board. The clients have to have watched all of the live streams and we process it and we look for findings and we make recommendations based on what we've seen. Very quick and dirty way to get feedback. The other way, if it's an in-depth interview or it requires a little bit more processing, or we have to create a report which will get shared um, with our clients, then we need to spend time analyzing it. So this is where we'll spend about a week going through all of the findings, making themes, understanding the nuances, and then creating a report presentation. And that, that report, most of the time is a document, a, a presentation that we'll present. But now what we're working with a lot of our clients is how do we make that something that's a lot more alive? So how do we use a living research repository so that the report isn't presented far away and never, never accessed again? And that is difficult because it depends on the clients, what tools they have already, how they want to access the data. That's a whole other kettle of fish. Um, oh, here's some pictures. So um, one of I think a couple of things that I wanted to touch on was um, most of our communication with our respondents is over WhatsApp. We seem to find that that's the best communication method. And we've even do our consent over WhatsApp. So you'll see there's an example of messages that we will send a participant. There are T's and C's which somebody can read, but we know that they don't always read. So we highlight the most important and areas of that concept. We, we believe that the relationship between the research and the participant is vital. So explaining what is expected of them, what's not expected of them, if they want to get out at any point, how we're going to anonymize the data, all of that is, is in these WhatsApp messages so that by the time they get to the session, they know exactly what's happening and they know how to get rid of their data if they need, it, need to as well. Oh yeah, and then that's just an example of the difference between a report and a workshop. I think I've covered that as well. Cool. So I've spoken for now. That's amazing. Uh, I think we can ask some questions. If there are any questions, please have questions. Feels like I'm talking to science. There are some questions. Oh, excellent. I'll pop them on the screen. Uh, I think this is a comment from Kate. Uh, Dears to the rescue, we are so assuringly simple. Looks like a patient note file and hides extensive complexity. Was that in the, the I'm assuming it was Unisolve with the yes. interface. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, it does. It was actually designed. Um, it's a some 174 pixels or something, which fits on a dot matrix printer, which is, that was defined the size of the screen. So um, everything had to work that way, but obviously computer systems have moved forward. So this thing has bolt on like modals and scrolling screens and like additional things to try and make the, 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 the pharmacist's life a living hell, but um, they know it well, uh, which is amazing. But obviously, for new pharmacists coming in, it, the learning curve is massive. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, question from Tracy around starting with highlighting the importance of patient centricity in the de development of PMA a EHRs. Although the patient is the most important stakeholder, they're excluded from prod discovery. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, so with working with clinicians, what is nice is patient centricity is a thing that that a lot of the clinicians understand, um, and it's up to us, and we we've struggled with it, is making sure that the patient is represented in the best possible way. So, we do an awful lot of research, and unfortunately, it's still not enough. Um, we still don't understand the nuances of how South Africans, humans in general, interact with the healthcare system. Um, there's a lot of work that we still need to do to understand why they 
behave a certain way. Um, and we are using techniques and tools that I know of to try and help. So personas, I love, um, they, they're great for bringing in conversations. It's just a way to like put up a picture and say, that's a patient. Um, but yeah, they're often excluded because it's hard. It's a very difficult uh, person to talk to because it's very sensitive and we need to do it very carefully. I don't know if I answered the question and I'm sure it was a good question. Um, so, I'm just here. Um, so, if that's not true, then no one is understanding the way in which access the information. Yes. Okay. So, I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about how the different clinicians talk to each other without, um, without infringing Popia. Totally. So it has to be done with consent for the patient. So the way that, that Health Force has been designed, so Health Force has Kenna, um, Health Force and other things. Um, when a nurse interacts with the patient and they say, I'm gonna refer you to a particular doctor, do you give consent that that doctor can read all of the notes that I've written? And yeah, the, person, the patient can say no. Um, and then, then unfortunately the patient is gonna to have to um, repeat themselves with that new clinician and most of the time that we've experienced it the patients just want the best care possible and if the nurse says you know what i'm going to send the photos to the doctor is that okay cool the patients like great and as long as it doesn't make its way onto the internet which it, it won't because that's in the t's and these and um, that's usually that's usually fine but yeah we ab absolutely have to get consent and everything has to be secure you know following Popier to the letter everything needs to be encrypted and the, the developers can't have access to the clinical notes. It's, it's been super interesting to watch how the developers have created the piece of software, not being able to see the data that's being entered into and into the system. Um, if, sorry, I'm gonna ramble for a second. If a patient gives consent to a particular group, so I go into a DISCHEM and I give consent to DISCHEM, um, multiple or to a practice, like to skim, multiple clinicians within that practice are able to look at that data. So if we need to test things in the system, we'll have a clinician from that practice check um, and they're, they're legally allowed to, to, to view that information because the patient has given consent. It's a month enough time, I don't know. I don't understand. I need more context. What do they say? <laughs> I don't know. Joshua, maybe uh, elaborate on that one a bit. Might have been earlier, and I've forgotten yeah. what I've been said. Um, not really, actually. I, I think uh, UX research, if you've come from UX design and you're good at user research, it's very similar skills, a lot more, not a lot more empathy because you have empathy with everybody that you test to. But if any of the researchers have had an awkward moment in finance, so let's say you have speaking to somebody and you've realized that they're in massive debt and they're like telling you about how they can't afford to send the kid to school, that's the same. It's the same level of empathy that you have with somebody, with a patient Luckily for me and none of our researchers, we, we haven't had anybody that has, he's in a really terrible situation um, and has kind of broken down in a, in, a, in a talk, but I'd say it's very similar skills um, from, from usability testing and in-depth interviews and, and chatting to people. Obviously there are skills involved. I, I wouldn't recommend uh, everybody going out and talking to patients. They need to be trained in how you do research, but, but it's the same the same skill set that you would use in usability testing or in-depth interviews. Um, Kate again. Um, a lot of research in medical journals where patients have been consulted. Uh, so um, if there is research in medical journals, that research study would have had to get uh, ethical approval. And the way, from what I understand, the way that a patient is allowed to be 
that the data from that patient is allowed to be used, it has to be anonymized to a certain extent. So you can use identifiers like a number, but you definitely can't use identifiable information, an ID number or name and surname or telephone number. Um, and you'll probably find that any of the information that's in a journal wouldn't ever mention particular patients. So they might be consulted um, if they're in the study, um, that they're a part of a study, but I don't know the exact nuances of it, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, how did you reach this great yeah. question? So, yeah, I mean, that, it comes up a lot. Most of our clients have some form of technology, which means by default, their target market has some form of technology. And we've been able to do remote tests on WhatsApp. Um, with we, we buy a person data, we send them the data, and we're able to do a call or even screen share on WhatsApp on really low end devices. But there is a limit. There is a, a point at which the tech savviness and the access to technology does end. And then, then we would have to do um, in person. So we have a number of, of financial companies that are trying to do really simple chat uh, finance. Um, and, and that is done in other languages. And most of the time we found that that being done in person is a little bit more important. Um, there's also a couple of banks that have asked us to go and stand in a bank and chat to people in the queue. Um, so then it is important to do that that face to face. But but it, I'm still surprised actually just how diverse we can go uh, with remote research. But understanding that if you do that, you are only seeing people who can afford the data and have the phone that that can that can actually call you. Um, and if your target market is more than that, then yeah, you're gonna have to go out and, and see them face to face. Uh, uh, in that situation, I wouldn't recommend what we did, what we used to do, which was we have a lovely lab with cameras and soundproofing, which I've set up, I think I've set up four in my lifetime. Um, I wouldn't recommend that either because for that person to get to you costs them so much money and time. We saw that for a person to come for an hour session, that's most of the day gone because it takes an hour to get to you, an hour with you, and then an hour back to work. And you're paying 70, 80 rand in taxi fees. Um, it doesn't really make sense. So in that situation, I would recommend that you go to areas where they are um, and try and find them and make a little make that access a little bit easier. Interesting one around emotional safety. Yeah, Mari, thanks for that. Um, it, it, yeah, uh, probably not enough, to be absolutely honest. Um, we uh, never have a researcher work on their own. Oh, actually, that's not totally true. That does happen. But in situations like this, seldomly is a researcher the only person doing the research. They'll be the only person on the call with that um, participant, but they'll have somebody that takes notes of them. They'll have somebody that works with them. And often that moment just to kind of process and be like, what did I just watch? Um, makes managing those emotional situations a little bit easier. Granted, um, we probably could do better. Uh, what we have soon is um, access to Kenna mental health professionals. So uh, that's going to be probably something that everybody at Howmind we will have access to, where you're able to video call a, a mental health professional as well if you need to chat about things. Um, another question from Kate. I have not. I will do that, though. Thanks, Kate. I don't know that, but I will have a look at it. And then there was one question right at the beginning. Yeah. Which I suspect, <laughs> or I think, <laughs> someone went to your website and saw your job opening. 
<laughs> it is a remote job. So yes, um, we are trying to hire more senior UX researchers. Um, we are mostly in Cape Town, but we have um, one person in the Netherlands and maybe another person in Joburg. Uh, but it is mainly remote. Um, ideally in South Africa, probably. Um, we are trying to expand the languages in which we do research. Um, so that will, that could be a factor. But um, yes, the, the job is remote. Oh, and to answer the title, it's not that exciting. Hopefully you figured it out. But basically in the clinic, we are competing with, with uh, paper and the pharmacist doesn't have a mouse. So that's where that title came from. It got you here, didn't it? <laughs> it certainly did. <laughs> Are we done? Any last questions. I think we're done. Thanks, everybody. That was that pretty was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. It was great. Thank you so much. If it anyone wants to drop me an email or ask another question, I'm very happy to, to have a conversation about it. There's certainly some. I, I, I had the, the unfortunate um situation where I, I had to spend the weekend in hospital with my son and i was quite surprised when i saw all the medical staff um had a it was a very it was it was obviously a tablet or um that was packaged into a very robust sort of um i'm going to say protective um, you could see it's like a rubbery, but very robust. So it could fall and drop in ER and um, and it had a strap around. And so every time they come around and do a person's vitals or whatever, they actually had to, every time they leave the room, enter the data. Um, so I saw your little uh, vitals that you had on one of your screens earlier. Um, and they would just enter the vitals of the person and whatever medication they just gave them. So it was really cool for me to see that there's some kind of technology happening um, that they were interacting with, less paper, and it was instant. You know, every time after they did some kind of check, it was, they, they really did skip the paper route. It was really cool. Yeah. Uh, it, it's super interesting working with nurses because they are some of the hardest working individuals I've ever met. Um, I, I have yet to interview minors, but I think nurses are just incredible. They, uh, at many clinic, they have 12 hour shifts. Most of the hospitals is a 12 hour shift. Yeah. They are optimistic and positive. And it, it, there's like any sort of intervention, you have to be very careful about how you pitch it because you, you cannot tell them that you wanna make what they do more efficient because they think that you mean they need to work harder, which is impossible. So you have to be very careful. It's like, well, yes, we're gonna make this iPad, but it's gonna make your job easier. It's not tracking you. It's not checking that you're doing your job correctly. It's it's trying to make, they're trying to give you time back so that you can actually sit down for, for 20 minutes and, and have lunch. And um, so it's really interesting how to, how to manage that. But uh, yeah, so I'm really glad and happy that they have bits of technology in there that work. And... Yeah. Okay. Cool. If there aren't any more questions, Everybody. there's a lot of thank yous coming through. Thank you so much, Chris. It's very insightful. Absolute pleasure. Was great fun. Um, yeah. Cool. I think. I don't know if Justin has gone, if he's still here, or if it's just my connection. But thank you, Chris, so much. Um, we will make the recording available for people to watch who um, wants to check it afterwards, or people who couldn't um, attend today. And yeah, just thank thanks a lot. And um, yeah, anything from you, Justin? No, just thanks again, Chris. That was really great. Thanks, Liesel, for organizing. Thanks to everyone who joined in. Um, and for the questions. And yeah, it usually takes YouTube about 24 hours to process mm. all the videos and do all the checks to make sure we're not up uploading nasty things. Um, and then it'll be available. Yeah. So please, please, uh, we encourage people to share uh, links to the channel. Um, you can see the 
uh, all the past things we've done as well, which I think is great. Cool. See you at the next one. Thank you. Very much. Chat soon. Thank you. Ciao. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.